Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, everybody. I heard Ernie yesterday, and he said, hi, family. And that was so nice, you know, because then I feel that we are all in this together. Um, I'm Margarita. I'm a recovered alcoholic today. And it's truly by the grace of God and these 12 steps and good sponsorship that I'm standing here today. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit what I was like, what happened, and uh, how it's like today. And how I finally found the solution for my alcoholism after 40 years of drinking. Um, um, I'm, uh, I'm a twin. Um, my family had no alcoholic problem, no one. Um, it was middle class, it was, I had a good upgrowing, there was nothing wrong with that. Um, the only thing I've been thinking about is my twin sister, she's not an alcoholic, she's never had a problem with, with alcohol. She was, she could drink or leave it alone. Alcohol didn't exist like a problem for her at all. At all. But what I noticed was that uh, when I talked to her later, she was talking about uh, our youth and she asked me, don't you remember when we did that and that and we were playing theater and we did this and that? And I just, uh, no, and that that girl was there, and her name was this, and and I, no, I don't remember. I don't remember. And we have a joke about that, you know, I-S-M, incredibly short memory. I just wasn't there. I wasn't there. I, I don't remember. I was already in my bubble. It, I was self-centered as a child. It was sort of, I was in my bubble. And um, at 14 years old, I took my first drink. And I remember it very well. We were at, um, I was visiting some friends, and they, I remember the bottle. It was white wine, and uh, I drank that wine, and it just, it was just magic what happened to me. You know, I had this spiritual experience. I had an internal shift. And as it says in the Nine Step Promises, my outlook and attitude to the whole world changed. Everything changed. All my fears disappeared. I just woke up. I woke up from that bub- bubble I've, I've been in. You know, I had a spiritual awakening and it was magic. And the only thing I could think about, I got drunk, of course, the first time I got drunk. But the the only thing I could think about was, when can I do this again? And my brain can only remember success. success. And my, my brain immediately recorded that success. And, and I was, after that, I was thinking about when can I do this the next time? When can I feel like that the next time? And my life changed there because nothing was ever good enough anymore without it. You know, I, I was thinking about it. I was longing for it. I was longing to have that feeling of freedom that I got. I could talk to anyone. I could talk any language. I could flirt with the guys. I was beautiful. And you know, you know what I talk about. 
That was what was happening when I drank alcohol. That was what alcohol did for for me. That I had a spiritual experience. It was magic. So I knew that I just had to drink alcohol to feel that way. And I did. I did. Every time I had an opportunity, I drank. The thing is that I felt good for a while, but I always got drunk. Always. So I had, I was genetically wired like that. I had the allergy from the beginning, from my first drink, like Peter said. I, 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 was, I, I was an alcoholic. I, I just didn't know that alcohol was my solution. Alcohol wasn't my problem. It was my solution when it worked for me. And I drank, and I drank. And I drank for 20 years. When we finished school, uh, my twin sister, she, uh, we both went to Stockholm. We moved to Stockholm. She got a job at a, at a telephone center and started to support herself. I went to Stockholm and I met a disc jockey from England who was uh, an amphetamist. And I, I, I was together with him because that was exciting and that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to party. I wanted to have fun. I wanted to feel like that all the time. And I was partying all the time. And I also used outside stuff. But like Peter said, my drug of no choice was alcohol. I always went back to alcohol. And when I took other stuff, I could drink more alcohol. And I was drinking like a mad dog for 20 years. For 20 years. And I got into relationships and out of relationships. Uh, I had a, I had gave birth to a daughter during this time. I, alcohol was my master. It took me everywhere that I could have never done on my own power. Alcohol was my power. Alcohol made it possible for me to do crazy things that I never could have done on my own. And that's what, also if you, if you look at the nine step promises, you know, it says that God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. At that time, alcohol did for me what I could never, never do for myself. But from that, when I started to drink, I started immediately to live on self-will. It was all about what I wanted, what I needed, what I thought that I needed to be okay. And I was like a tornado running through the lives of others. I really was. I was changing partners. I was, if something wasn't good enough, I just dumped it. Next, next, next. I, I, it's not good enough here, I move there. And I nearly didn't work in this time. I didn't do, I was really, really messed up. In 1979, I um, came up to the countryside where my parents lived because I had nowhere else to go. And I came from an abusive uh, relationship, which I had put myself in because I had made a selfish decision that that was good for me at the moment. And I put myself in that. But anyway, I came up to my parents' place with my daughter in, my, in one of the hands and the plastic bag in the other. And I came up to them because I, I had nowhere else to go. And um, I got restless, irritable, and discontent. I couldn't stay with them. So I met um, a guy who was an alcoholic because he drank like me and that was that suited me fine 
And, but when I was up there, I think it saved my life because I had to, I knew a lot of people there because this house, we, we've been there when we were children and I knew a lot of people and I, I just had to try and control it. So that's when I tried, started to try to control my drinking. I really did try, but I did not succeed. <coughs> We were drinking together, and he was drinking worse than me, I thought. So I drank behind him, but I was just as bad. And um, we were together for 10 years, and then I decided, no, uh, he's not good enough for me. He's drinking too much. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, we separated. And I uh, lived on my own, and I started to drink uh, alone, at home. Because I thought, if I can be alone, I can drink like I want to drink. Just as I, I can, you know, fill the bathtub up and have these glasses of wine, this illusion, you know, that I can, I can control it and I can enjoy it. <laughs> But it never worked. It never worked. The, the result was that I, I got very isolated. Because I knew that I couldn't go out and drink because I lost control all the time. All the time. I knew. Um, so I, I, I was isolated, but I had some friends that was also drinking, of course, and one of them asked me if I wanted to go to Norway for a three-day ride, uh, go up in the mountains and, uh, you know, to a hotel up in the mountains. And I said, no, no, I don't want to go. Fear, because I knew there was going to be drinking. And when I was at home, I thought I could control it. I thought I could, I'm just drinking, uh, I'm just going to drink three. And then I, I drank more, but I, as I went to bed and I woke up and I thought, oh, nothing happened, I was alone, so it was okay. But I didn't dare to go out, but this time I went and it was like always, I started to drink and I had drinks with me and I got so drunk and I don't remember anything of those three days and I, I on the way home I bought more liquor and I couldn't stop drinking. I couldn't stop drinking and that was the first time I um, asked for help and I went to my first treatment center. And um, I was devastated when I went there, but it was, it was magic for me to come there because I thought I was the only one in the whole world who had this problem. And I noticed that I came together with other people with the same problem as me, and my ego rebuilt, and I started to listen to their stories, and they'd been robbing uh, shops, and you know, uh, and I thought, oh, poor people, I'm not like that. I'm not like that. So I took care of them a bit and they told me there that um, I have you cannot drink alcohol is your problem so I thought okay I go home now because I feel okay so I don't drink anymore and I was also introduced to AA the first time there i would never been to AA I had no idea what AA was and I was introduced to AA and I came to these meetings and they were talking about their feelings and, and about their day. And in the beginning I thought that was great, you know, because it was all new for me. It was all new for me and I didn't know anything else. Anyway, um, I was nine years out and in of Alcoholics Anonymous in this contemporary AA. And I didn't get better when I stopped drinking. I got worse. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. I sat in, in those meetings and, you know, <sighs> fearful, anxious, self-conscious, self-centered, and they all seemed so happy, some of them. 
And I, I, I just thought, what's wrong with me? And I went out drinking again, and I went back to AA, and I went out drinking again. And then um, I decided to uh, go abroad, because I thought that would help if I make a trip. Or don't make a trip, I make a trip. So I went abroad and I went to India. And I will also mention that I had started to take um, uh, tranquilizers, sedatives, uh, volume, what you call them. I took tablets. I took anything that could change the way that I felt. And I went to India and I had a nice time there. It, it was okay, it was okay, I was uh, uh, taking tablets, but I didn't drink that much, and I went back again uh, to Sweden, I drank, I drank all the time, and I w but I had a new goal, I'm, I'm going back to India again, so I was there three times, and I thought I was quite okay, because I could control it, because I was abroad, and I was, I, I was feeling okay. Then I was invited to a family for a dinner, and, and um, they asked me what I wanted to drink, and I said, uh, oh, do you have water or something? Because they didn't know that I was drinking. And um, they said, no, we don't have any water, water, but we have a beer. And I said, okay, I'll take that beer. Suddenly, suddenly, I took that beer, and, and I was drunk for one and a half years. One and a half years from that beer. I went directly down to the bar, and I got so drunk, and I spent three months there. I was drinking every day from morning till night. I didn't find my, my way home, I, was, I wasn't eating, it was horrible, horrible for three months. And um, um, I got a call from home because my, my children couldn't get hold of me, that my family didn't know where I was, and uh, I got a call from home that I had to come home because my mother had died. So I... I got help to come home because I couldn't, I couldn't uh, take myself home on my own. So I came home and uh, the funeral was the next day and I was full of pills but I didn't drink and I went uh, into the garden where all, all my whole family was and my daughter was there and um, she was so, she told me later, she was so angry with me. She was so angry with me. She didn't even know if I was dead or alive or anything because, you know, it was all about me, all about me. And she said, but when she saw me, she was thinking to herself, my mother is dying. And she took me aside because I was wobbling around the garden, I, w I was totally wacko, and she took me aside, and she took my hand, she looked me in the eye, and I looked her in the eyes, and something happened. Her eyes were filled with tears, big blue eyes, very beautiful eyes, I just hadn't seen them, you know, and she looked me in the eyes, and she said, Mommy, you have to do something, because you are dying. And I only have you, she said, because her father is gone and I hadn't cared about her or anything. And something just happened. And I know today that it was uh, God's grace who came into me. I, I had that moment of clarity. I think it was maybe two minutes. But I saw my life like like this. And I saw that it was me. I saw what I had done to the people who loved me the most. My family who had cared so much for me. I saw, I saw it all. And I just collapsed. It was like time collapsed for me. It was this um, 
absolute defeat and I just knew that I cannot take another drink. I cannot take another pill. And that was it. It was just two minutes. And uh, I, I just... I had nowhere to live, so I stayed with a friend, and I was uh, detoxing from pills. I'd been taking pills for, you know, over, I think 10, 12 years. And I don't advise anyone to do what I did, but I just knew that I cannot take one more pill or one more drink. I just knew in here that I can't. And the, I suffered the next three months and I was down on my knees like Peter said and I said God help me help me and I think help me means thy will be done because it means that I cannot help myself you know and I prayed to a God that I didn't understand but it was like, you know, when, when, uh, when you go to the electric chair, when you know that there is no human power that can help you anymore, because I had tried everything. I had tried everything. Who do you call for? Or when you sit on a plane and the, you know the plane is going to crash. Who do you call for? You call for God. Whoever you think that is. Because I knew that my children couldn't save me. My family couldn't save me. No AA meeting could save me anymore. You know, I prayed to God to help me. And I couldn't I couldn't eat, I couldn't talk, I couldn't walk, and I just prayed for God to help me to eat a banana. Help me, God, to eat a banana. Help me to take me to the shower. Help me, you know, for every, anything. And I, I went to my final third treatment center. The treatment never made me sober, but this time I had no choice. I had no choice. So I went to my last treatment center and I was a wreck. I was a wreck. But this time of suffering, I am so grateful for that time of suffering because my ego couldn't rebuild itself because I was detoxing from these tablets. That was awful. So it kept my ego down, you know. And I went to this um, last treatment center, and I found this book, and I read A Vision for You, and I knew that this is me, and I have to find these people in some way. But I didn't know how, and I came, came back home, and I went, went to aftercare. And I can see today how after my, my surrender, I was led to the right people. That God led me right in Sweden, where nobody was using the big book at all. On my meetings where I was, it was, they read out of 12 and 12, and then they talked about dogs and cats. You know? That was how it was. Nobody talked about the big book. Anyway, I came to the aftercare. The guy there, I was devastated. I said, please help me. What, what do I do? You know, I know that I will drink again. It's not a matter about... If I'm going to drink, it's when will I pick up that drink again? Because who can stand to feel the way that I did, you know? So this aftercare guy, he just looked at me. I said, just help me, help me. What do I do? And he gave me uh, Gresham's Law. And I read that, you know, strong AA, medium AA, <laughs> 
strong coffee, medium coffee, and I understood again, this is what I have to have. This is what I have to have. After that, I was sent to a seminar. There were some guys from another town, and that guy had been sponsored by a guy who had been sponsored by Joe McQueenie. <laughs> it's just, just and uh, I went to that seminar and they went through the steps and I was sitting there and people said well this was a nice course and oh it's nice to learn about this and I just said this is not a course for me this is about life and death for me I know that is I have to do this or I will drink and I will die and they just looked at me with that was a crazy girl. Because I was really, really, I knew, I knew. And after that, I, I went to my AA meetings because I had nowhere else to go. And then suddenly it was one man there who had done the steps. And he saw that I was desperate for help. And he said, you have to do the steps. You have to do the steps. And he took me to detox to t tell my story. Uh, this, this is just incredible what happened to me. You know, all the stuff that happened to me. And then um, he was always sharing about the steps for me at the meetings. And he took me to detox and he said, you have to do the steps. But I said, I have to have help. And I, I'd asked for sponsors, and they had t taken me to co for coffee, and they told me about uh, their miserable life. <laughs> you know? I didn't know what a sponsor was. <laughs> but there was another guy in the meetings. And um, we were sitting together, dying inside the rooms of AA. And this guy... His name is Joran, and he is a member of my group today. We have a small group called the Big Book Group in Bolenge. And bless you, Joran, if you ever hear this. He had, had met another guy who had done the steps, and they had just started a new group. And he was on fire with this, because he'd been in AA, and he, he was dying inside the rooms of AA. And they started a new group, and he said to me, Margarita, come, come to our group. And I went there, and we were just, I think, six people. And he helped me through the steps, and I was ready. I had already taken one, two, and three. But I didn't know what was wrong with me until... Uh, they explained to me from this big book that I had an allergy to alcohol and I had an obsession of, of, in my mind. I had this strange mental blank spot that I had no defense against the first drink, that I was powerless over alcohol and that my problem centers in my mind and that I had no choice. And I knew that. But it explained to me. The allergy explained why I got drunk every time. The obsession explained why I couldn't leave it alone, even though I had promised myself millions of times, crying, <laughs> meaning it, that I will, if I just make it this time, I will never drink again. I promised my family, I promised my children, I promised everyone never to drink again. And my family said, why are you drinking, Margarita, when you know what's happening every time? I don't know. I was just going to have a few to take the edge off. And they asked me when I tried to not drink. But you're not drinking now. Why aren't you feeling good? <laughs> I don't know. I'm feeling miserable. You know? I didn't understand my problem. My problem was I didn't understand my problem. I did understand my problem from this book, from the first step, that I am powerless over alcohol. I have lost the power of choice forever, because at certain times I don't have 
the mental effective defense against the first ring. Because otherwise, what am I doing here? If I could choose not to drink, I would be at home choosing not to drink and do other <laughs> stuff. I am, I, I'm not cured about, uh, from alcoholism. I did these steps, and I think, you know, the last three steps, I did all the steps, I did my amends, I had a spiritual awakening, and it has to be better than the one I got from alcohol when it worked for me. It has to be better, because otherwise I will go back. And this program is so much more than just not drinking, you know. This is so much more. I'd lost the power of choice, and I knew that. I knew that. And this little group got me into helping others at once. I was just newly sober, you know, and I, I lived in a small apartment in Borlänge, and they took people there because it was convenient because I lived there alone. So they took people there, and I was there, and we were doing fifth steps, and we were helping others, and I was just new, and it saved my life. It saved my life. I, I, I just lit up, you know. This is the juice to be able to give this away. And so important to do it very early on. It says in the book, nothing will help you more than, than to go out and help others in, in the beginning of your sobriety because it's like this, yeah? So I, I am so fortunate to have found this solution in this book. And um, I knew I, I got another sponsor, and that was because I was into it. You know, uh, my recovery comes first and above everything else. And I was uh, going on Skype meetings, and I was on cliffs in Texas, Dallas, and... Um, um, there was a woman from Denmark who was sponsored by him, so I asked her to sponsor me. And she took me through the big book, boom, 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 like that. And I needed that because, so that I could carry the message from the book exactly as it's outlined here. And she took me, I think it took three weeks over Skype. And I had another spiritual awakening. And I have spiritual awakenings all the time. Because this is never ending. This is a, a journey. You know. And I've just started a journey. And, and it's a beautiful journey. But I have recovered. The mental obsession is gone. Because I had to find another solution than alcohol. And that solution must be better than what, when alcohol worked for me. And I have found that solution in this book. And I've had a spiritual experience. And I'm trying to carry this message to as many people as I can. Everyone that God puts in my life, I am responsible. Not the one beside me. Not that one or that one or you. I am responsible. And I never forget that guy in the meeting who had taken the steps and talked about the steps. The only one who did that. He was sitting there for me. And I know that God led me to all these people so that I could find this program, so that I could recover and not die in this disease. And I mean, God is doing amazing things for me today. We're here in California. I came from cold Sweden and this wasn't my plan. I mean, seven years ago I couldn't go to the mailbox. <laughs> and I'm standing here today. I was scared to death. What if I meet a neighbor? I don't know what to say. I, w I didn't want to see anyone. I didn't know how people could live I was, I remember I was standing in my, my, my window, 
looking at people going with the, these sticks and dogs and being happy. And I was standing in there just miserable and I wondered, how do they do that? How can they be happy just going out with a dog or stick and, be, and just talking crap? How do they do that? <laughs> so I, I went to my solution. The only solution that I knew, you know, alcoholism. I mean, I didn't know that I was suffering from a deadly, progressive, illness. I didn't know that. I thought that I was okay if I didn't drink. And that's the big lie, that I think I'm okay if I don't drink. I have to do something about this condition, because I was worse sober than drunk. I didn't know how to live. This book has learned me how to live one day at a time. Because I had to find a power that was greater than me. And I have found that power by which I can live one day at a time. And it's my responsibility to keep in fit spiritual condition God doesn't do for me what I can do for myself. He loves me, but he doesn't come uninvited. I have the responsibility to keep myself in fit spiritual condition, to access this power every day. And it says here, it's easy to... Yeah, rest on your laurels. I have... One day, one day's reprieve. Yes, that's what it says. And that's my responsibility. And I live in this step. And I live in this book. And I know there is no other way for me. Because I tried it. I tried to live in the three dimensions of life. Work, you know, live like other people. Doesn't work for me. I had to be catapulted into the fourth dimension for me to be able to exist in this world as the alcoholic that I am. And I am so grateful. I am so grateful that for everyone who is carrying this book to show that there is a solution. There is a solution. And I mean, I think God got tired of seeing people like us die. And he, he sent, he put some people together so that this book could be written for me and for you. So that we don't have to die in the gutter. Because that's where I would have ended up. And I am so grateful to be here, and um, and Angie and Jeff, they have left their whole house up for us, and the hospitality, and uh, it's just amazing what God can do. If I do what, I, what I'm supposed to do, because I know why I'm here today. I know why I am alive. It is to carry this message to people who were like me, who is like me. And there is no hopeless case. If you really want this, it's for everyone. I think I stopped there. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all. And excuse me for my bad English. <laughs> I wish I could have done it in Swedish, but <laughs> you have to come to Sweden. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, 
Visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.